David, I would like to start by asking you about your early years in Toronto, my hometown too. You were born in 1931, and within your first six years, you personally experienced a coronation in London, were in the presence of Adolf Hitler, witnessed the German army preparing maneuvers to invade Belgium, etc. Please tell me more about these experiences. Well, you've certainly cut to the chase. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is not about me. Um, I was persuaded to write the book by business associates, friends, and uh, educators because it was the times that I, were, I was born. Nothing to do with me. Being born in 1931 was a unique time. So I experienced a touch of the Depression. Um, I, my father, being a distinguished war hero in the First World War, was invited to the coronation of King George VI. And so I sat in the stands outside Buckingham Palace and left an indelible impression, that like golden coach and the royal horse guards. Um, then, my mother being an opera singer, we were invited over to Bayreuth, to the Wagnerian Opera Festival, and we were in the presence of Hitler. Then in driving to Berlin, all the maneuvers where the uh, panzer divisions and the infantry, Wehrmacht, were all exercising down to the border, turning around. That happened 14 times. And then 15th time, they went through to Paris, literally on motorcycle cars in some cases because of the circumstances of the time. So then I went, visited the graveyards and the monuments of the First World War, standing next to my dad. The only time I saw him cry, he really? was awarded the Military Cross twice for bravery, and yet it was so emotional. And my darling wife, Jill, where is she? Oh, <laughs> Jilly, uh, is taking me to the site where he was wounded um, and apparently bound himself with sulfur. All we had in those days was no penicillin, but sulfur and bandages. And he then went over the top that night to rescue his men who were caught on barbed wire. The second time he learned a lesson. If you're going to get wounded, don't wear your uniform because <laughs> it has bacteria. And you've been in the trenches for weeks. Uh, so he went out in his underwear, got hit again for his, for his efforts. And um, so he was a remarkable man, but he never talked about the war. And Jilly's going to take me back to the very site he was wounded. Uh, his regiment, just to get this morning, located the site where he, he, he was positioned in the 8th Canadian Battalion. So that'll be very exciting. But the point and is, the, those experiences at a young age, and uh, that bears a lot to what I'm going to say in a bit about education. At age six, I was totally aware and remember those moments, and they were a very formal part of my life. And for example, at six, I was so impressed by the horse guards and that pageantry at the coronation, 13 years later, I joined the horse guards and active duty for a year and four years of reserve. It shows you that perhaps if I had had been a child at risk, like we have in our community, I would probably join a gang at age six, be signed up because I didn't have that great opportunity that I had. And that's also why Jill and I are very active in the educational area uh, building these schools because I believe that is the moment in life between six weeks mm -hmm. and five years that that mind sets for as far as discipline, respect, character. I don't speak one, but badly. <laughs> so 
It's, it's, it's a child's world, the, the brain is like a sponge, right. and when it's not exercised, for example, in the community here, the 15 year study has proven a child at risk who hasn't had a preschool education formal, what happens is there's 70% chance by the time well, he is 18, he will be a criminal. Now in our schools, there's one in San Diego and in Las Vegas, 70% would join gangs of underprivileged children because they get no respect for the first five years. Why not? Mm -hmm. And they think that that's when they first got respect. When World War II came to an end, you were 13 years old and your parents were scrambling to find a suitable school for you. How did that experience unfold? Well, that was really the crossroads, the watershed of my life, because the war years, those five years, was pretty lonely for me, only because my older sisters all were doing their own thing. One joined the Air Force, one was uh, artists and so on. So I was shipped out to a ranch in the Western Canada in the summer, and there were no young kids at all, so I had to make my own fun and pleasure. So they and you thought, were born in Winnipeg. Sorry? You were born, born in, in Winnipeg. Born in Winnipeg, yeah. So at Banff, Alberta, we, my uncle, who was a general in the First World War, had a ranch, and so I was there, and my total company for the summer was my horse. And it was great. One day I was Custer, and the next day I was Custer's last stand. <laughs> <laughs> so my parents decided he's 13 now, and the war is over, and there's chaos, the troops coming back, and it was chaos in the community. We better send him to a boarding school. Great idea. So I was moved out of Upper Canada College Day School and made a boarder at Trinity College School. Well, that was all fine and well, but arriving at 13, I was the youngest boy in the school. To get a place, my father said, oh, sure, I, he may have known or not known, but jumped to form. So everything was Greek to me from then on, except history and English. And so really interesting times. So by the time I was 16, uh, my father had definitely come to the conclusion that I was dumb as a doorpost and couldn't pass exams except I'd get A's in history and zero in <laughs> mathematics. <laughs> but you skipped two forms. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, it was just, I didn't figure it out. And because at 13, I just thought this is the way life is. And my dad was so busy, he didn't, wasn't told. But so they stuffed me in the attic of the headmaster's house. And then I was put into the school and became the easy punching bag because there I was scrawny and 13. Oh. <laughs> well, that was good for me. <laughs> so so and, if you fast forward three years, your dad calls, you write about this in the book, your dad summons you to the study. Oh, yes. When I was 16, called in on a weekend. We used to get one weekend holiday. So he called me into the study and he said, son, <clears throat> I love you a lot, but you're not doing well in your exams, so I'm gonna give you a choice. You can travel every summer while you're in school years, every holiday, I'll dump you off on a tramp steamer or whatever gets you there. You get $10 a day, which was plenty in those days. To right. You have one beer a day and not much else, but anyway, um, so that, or I'll leave you a little sum of money when you graduate, if you ever do, um, to start a business. So I decided I'd go for my PhD in travel. So, and those, so here I am, 70 years later, eight million miles, and with a PhD in travel, which gave me and perhaps explained why my little business ventures invariably never were in the same business. 
because by in one condition he made me travel alone. First I thought he wanted to get rid of me. And why be alone? When I, Jill and I travel in Europe and we see packs of children going over there for their wonderful education, they sit there and flirt, drink, and carry on and go to a couple of museums, which really doesn't do much right. for the development. By me going alone, he knew I'd be an observer. I'd be listening when I'd rather be talking. I was, and I'd meet people. You must have uh, met some very interesting uh, people uh, because you went to some very interesting places. Who, who were some of the people you met on well, your travels? Well, I, I don't bring that subject up much in the book because I was advised, don't drop names because that just makes it very light. But if I ever wrote another book, have I got some stories? Oh, good. <laughs> but but uh, my first encounter was I ended up in Madrid, went to a bullfight, went into a tapas bar, and was standing at the end of the bar with my usual uniform. It was a blazer, white ducks, and a clean shirt. And this gray, semi-gray bearded fellow in the corner with an entourage said, called me over to the table and he said, Young man, are you doing anything? Are you alone? Would you like to join us for a drink? That ended up being two weeks traveling the whole tour of the Corridas with Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> if I had been with a friend or a pack of friends, there's no way I would have been engaged by Mr. Hemingway. Right. Then I went, so I used to I had a budget of one beer, so I went to the uh, Ritz Hotel in Madrid one evening, and there was a lady that had been in a meeting, beautiful lady in the corner, and <clears throat> when the, her business, obvious business uh, associates had left, she called me over, and I thought, oh, this is quite tasty. Uh, not at all, it was Grace Kelly, oh. and she'd had so much to drink, They'd been plying her, I guess, to get her to do a film, that she asked me to escort her, and that's all, to her room, which I did. So, and on and on. And you talk about the value <clears throat> of traveling alone, and it gave you the opportunity to observe, perhaps more than speak. And when you think about the impact on your business life, I know you write about this in the book a little bit, what value did you derive from that experience of traveling alone and being able to be a keen observer. And in particular in the book, you have a story about when you were on your golf course uh, in Fiji, when you had a, a big hunch or a big epiphany. Every one of the companies that I was involved with, or the startup, was just inspired by, in fact, much to my wife's chagrin, I, I've become a dreamer. <laughs> I don't like driving a car because I'm constantly looking. And so ideas come to my mind. And in this case, Jill and I were on the golf course, our little golf course in the island. And the couple in front was, took out a bottle of Avion from their golf thing, which we supplied. And um, I said, something wrong with this picture. Jill said, what are you talking about? The parrots croaking to loudly or what's the problem and it was just a fact here was somebody drinking a bottle of French water from a population center of two billion people pollution when I felt within a hundred miles of where I was standing there was the ultimate water so we discovered the water and I was so convinced because in America if you remember in 96 there was so much press about the pollution of cities. City water was undrinkable, and, and just I felt it was the time. So people said, well, have you done a marketing survey? No, I built the factory right over the discovery of the aquifer <clears throat> and started Fiji water. But weren't there like 600 other companies doing that at the time? That's all. The reason I sold Fiji water eventually is because it became a bottled water became a commodity. It went from 600 to thousands. 
And, uh, you know, I just lost interest and somebody really wanted it badly, so I sold it because it was commoditized. I lose interest in things that are a commodity. I want things that are so unusual and perhaps survive the commodity experience. So when you think about that, from that, that moment of epiphany to when you, when you sold it, um, yeah, and there have been business case stories written about Fiji Water and, um, and particularly kind of your marketing strategy. Maybe you could touch on, kind of, I know there are three components to, to subscription, really, in, probably across a lot of your businesses, but can you talk about the business case and kind of your three steps? Well, this is an unusual story, Fiji Water. Um, beverage companies were huge. They had, they'd launch a new brand with 10, 20 million dollars off the gate in television and publishing. So I said, I'm not going to play that game. I'm not going to pay for play where stores like Publix are paid by to get endow displays and, and superior displays. I said, I'm going to do it on the merit of the product. So we had 36 tries at this design, which has been slightly uh, altered since I sold the company. But it was a stunning, <clears throat> eye-catching design that you could spot it in a movie, television series, across a crowded room. And so taking the time to do this, we finally took a year to, to make the design. The square bottle instead of a round bottle, the see-through label, it told the story. But there's no point in having a beautiful package if it isn't followed up. So the three things you're referring to were my mantra. Visibility, number one. So I created the visibility by design and then putting it into the arena, not by newspapers <coughs> or television ads, but by very careful placement supplying the charities of America, getting it in the restaurants, um, marketing it in a different way. I remember I used to get myself into a Coca-Cola truck or whoever was distributing, and my knees under my chin, and the driver says, oh, Mr. Gilmer, what a pleasure to have you. I'll take you out to meet your clients. And I said, no, please. Take me to every client that wouldn't take Fiji water. <laughs> so I go there and I'd hand them my card, uncork the top, please taste it, here's my card. And they'd say, oh my God, Mr. Kerr, you're the owner, you're the chairman. <clears throat> I've seen it in films and movies. I'll take it. So then we had enough of a head of steam that when Coca Cola got around to telling publics, <laughs> take it off the shelf. We're paying you to, to be there. They said, the hell with you. Uh, <laughs> we're selling enough, and if I take it off the counter, our clients will be furious because we had enough traction. That was their mistake. <laughs> we got the traction, and it worked, and within eight years, we were selling 10 million cases a year and became the fastest growing premium beverage in the world. You start off your book, Health is Our Real Wealth. How did you come to that conclusion, and what impact did that conclusion have on the starting of Wakaya Perfection? Well, the, sh the shock of my life are two things, since, again, it's not about me, it's about the timing. 1931, I remember in traveling in Europe, so impressive was the health of the German people, the French, the English, except in where situations of poverty. <coughs> but the people were healthy and appeared to be quite well educated. I am staggered how the health of America has declined. I don't know whether it's a suicidal wish, it's not caring or not having the character. But in 1990, to give you a couple of stats to back it up, 
In 1990, 10% of America was obese. Today, it's over 30%. That's a staggering change. Uh, in a couple of years, one out of every three Americans will be, have diabetes. Now, when we did our research on the on what kind of perfection, these amazing stats came out. Guess how many colas are sold a day? One billion colas are sold a day. And whenever you see somebody that may have a weight problem, guess what? They're usually on one end of a cola. And even a diet cola is poisonous because they use aspartame and fructose sweeteners. So that's a shock. Um, obesity is also to do with saturated fat. Bad news for all of us that are beef eaters, but 10 billion animals are slaughtered a year. 10 billion. Cancer can hardly exist without sugar and saturated fats. But you kidded around, actually, um, when you make comments about all that, which is true, is that you're becoming a little bit more of a critic, right, than an author. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so what did you do about it, right? Because you're a man well, of action. and that's a certain a quick story on that. Having the success, I guess, of Fiji water, I was invited to be guest speaker five years ago at the American Express Luxury Conference in Miami, Four Seasons Hotel. 400 American Express people, four days to decide what is the greatest luxury in the world. So at the end of four days, everybody had come to the decision that time, a little more time in your life, time was the, lux the total luxury. So I was the last speaker, and I stood up, and I hadn't even had a glass of wine, but I said an outrageous thing. What's the point of having more time if you don't have your health? By 5 o'clock, I had them all convinced. And I'm driving back up to Palm Beach. I'm like, good God, Gilmore, after all these years, you've become, instead of an author, you've become a critic. What am I going to do about it? So my team, Jason and and David Roth and my team got together and we researched what is a real health issue. Time magazine, you might have seen the cover, which was, the cover was, the silent killer is inflammation, arthritis, Alzheimer's, heart disease, obesity, all to do with inflammation. So we found in Fiji that the indentured Indian labor coming from India in 1895 brought a sack of root for ginger and turmeric. And then they cut the seeds and they grew for decades. In the bordering of the sugar fields, which they were brought there to farm, the seeds would escape into the jungle. So we went in and studiously collected the wild ginger, but the original one, not the ginger that's grown today on land that is not organic, a lot of chemicals in it, and exhausted land. It's like asking your wife, would you like to have 400 children? <laughs> that, that square acre is tired. So our land is virgin, volcanic, rich in nutrients. This is an extraordinary seed. And then we experiment a lot with the way we treat it. I think it's since 1968, you, you haven't taken a salary. You don't have a company car. You haven't had one of those for pure, decades. Pure stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> no, in 68, when you're raising funds starting a company, you realize you lead by example. And when you, and I never got rid of the habit. I should have changed. My partner was taking hundreds of thousands of dollars and I was taking nothing. <laughs> Father may have been right. <laughs> But my, my calculation was, when you're starting a company, 
you're building it to get a multiple. Five times earning, seven, ten, these days up to 30. If I spend a dollar on expenses or a company car or taking a salary, I'm taking, if the multiple is seven, I'm taking six dollars value out of the company. And I've never been able to get rid of that thought. Other people have no problem. And uh, as I say, that's my only regret. <laughs> <laughs> One of the moves that you made that cost you a lot of money, right? You've been very successful by all measures. Um, but what advice, looking back, would you give to folks that are operating businesses, thinking about selling the business or stepping back, you know, when to kind of fish or cut bait, so to speak? Well, there are two things. I think it's the person you are. Um, I, I suggest to young people, think carefully when they start up and it's successful and they decide to cut bait and take a profit and move on. Better be a very good reason. I am not the wealth I did not acquire the wealth that I could have, because why? I would have had to live in a place that Jill and I didn't want to, and life's too short. I mean, I will not sacrifice, so... Are you talking um, of Barrett Gold in Toronto? Yeah. I mean, if I had hung in, you know, my partner and I were 50-50, I missed the boat as far as the major fortune. But no regrets, because I, I'd be still living in Toronto today, which I've lived in London and Paris with Jill and New York, and life has been wonderful if I'd been trapped in one place. So I sort of believe this thought. Men make money, but money does not make men. And so you got to decide, is the game, now I'm not saying that Money isn't a great measure of success, but I'm happy with our life, and um, it's been very satisfying, rewarding, that sense of adventure and what I've done, but money was not. In Silicon Valley and other startup communities, it is said if an entrepreneur has not had a setback, then he has not taken a risk, <laughs> and that these setbacks are mm -hmm. learning opportunities. You've had great successes, but did you have any learning curves that helped define you? Any. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> but I'll mention just a couple of amusing ones. It's not amusing for others, not for me. Okay. But um, this is 1960, and my partner and I, who's an engineer, and I consider myself a tastemaker in the sense of spotting the opportunity and guiding the, the design. And in those days, we felt that home entertainment was about the ugliest thing you had in your living room. Do you remember the high gloss cabinet and the big gold logo on the front? It was this ugly appliance in your decorated <laughs> drawing room. A joke. But people, that was all it was, it's available, and that was it. So we went into the industry very successfully. It was the fastest growing business in Canada since the Second World War, junior industrial. That's Claritone? Yeah. There was the most delightful old man in 1960 called Mr. May. He had the founder of the May department stores. They're no longer around, I believe, but that was, they were the great fashion stores of the, of the era across the country. And old Mr. May was getting to the end of his life, and I met him to pitch him on carrying our fine product, and he got very excited. He said, ah, oh, I want to give you the auditorium in St. Louis. It was a huge auditorium, and I'm going to invite all our clients. I want to show, show me something spectacular. Well, we've been working on a secret project called Project G. There was a remarkable high facade and the first of the solid state the transistors. So threw it together, beautiful piece, on stage, and Mr. May covered it with his red velvet blanket. 
And I came on stage, he introduced me, much excitement. Mr. Gilmore, would you please demonstrate the set? So I stood up over the set, took the cover off, turned on the set that had been finely tuned to give this extraordinary music. And what I got was sort of a Hiroshima type plume of smoke <laughs> <laughs> that rose out of the set. Thinking quickly, I took the velvet over it, and I said, now for my next trick. <laughs> he laughed, even though it was the most expensive set in the world. We sold three that afternoon, because he said, anybody that has the nerve to do that, I want one. And that was coming too early. That was the point. The lesson was, don't jump the starter block. And I did, and paid with an embarrassing afternoon. <laughs> Clear tone, really, when you think about it, was really cutting edge and in a lot of ways kind of pushed the envelope. Mm -hmm. you know, where you stand today at 85 years old, um, you're operating Wakaya Perfection, but you're also operating Zinio, which in its own right is pushing the envelope. Zinio has 6,000 magazines, 150 countries. Basically, you're digital magazine on your smartphone or iPad. Printing on paper is a 500 years old idea. <clears throat> and 10 years ago, I thought, this is unsustainable industry, eventually. It's cutting 35 million trees a year in America alone. This cannot go on, but also the age of invention. But that was before smartphones and iPads or anything else. And so I was too early. Paid the price, been a real struggle, absorbed too much of my capital, which was, in hindsight, a mistake. But now it's coming right because, yes, it's taken four years longer than I anticipated, but it is happening now. That when you can get a magazine in 18 languages, the choice of the world on your smartphone, and if I'm Russian in New York and I want to see the Russian car magazine, I can bring it down. On top of that, in working with IBM, we realized with their new technology called Watson, mm -hmm. that if I, you could be on a landing pattern to Rome and wa want to know a certain technical thing or about the arts, and Watson will take all the information we've calculated over the years, all stored all that content, distill it instantly and give it to you. That will be our breakthrough, and it's close. That's pretty powerful. You and your wife, Jill, have been giving back for decades. Uh, you've opened preschools in Fiji and across the United States. Why is preschool education such an important focus for you and Jill? Well, the reason I mentioned, I mean, the realization American health is going to hell in a tea cart, um, so is education. It's pathetic. I mean, a high school in New York last month graduated with pride, 74% of all the students, 4% eventually qualified that they could go to university. It's spinning our wheels. The fact that every American should have a chance to go to university. No, there should be more trade schools and you decide. University, there are five million jobs unfilled. Why? No. A, a really brilliant welder there's a job right there paying, and if he's got management ability, he can become a millionaire being a welder. And there's all these things that are being ignored. And meanwhile, the root of the whole problem is between six weeks and five years. We've proven it in our other schools. So we were busily building in Vegas for Andre Agassiz. We built his preschool, San Diego, 
And Jill and I were 25 years snowbirds here, lovely home, or as happy as clams in Palm Beach. Two years ago, we realized there's a calamity building across the bridge. West Palm Beach and parts of it are just in terrible straits, which we will pay the price in five years if we don't listen. And that is, take a child, preempt the risk of crime, drugs, and that problem by just giving them a start between six weeks and five years. I became a horse guard. I could have easily been a gang member. <laughs> I, know, I know like you'd you like to share a couple of uh, quotes oh, yeah. that you found these are, rewarding. These, these are my favorite quotes. Albert Einstein said, once you stop learning, you start dying. I think that's has validity, don't you? <laughs> this is by Helen Keller. The only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. Here's Winston Churchill, my hero. Farther back you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. How true that is. And that's why we keep just making politicians, definitely making the same old mistakes. Why? Nobody knows their history. 